Well, everyone, welcome back to a very exciting episode of the Storybox podcast. Today, my friends, I'm delighted to welcome Sheila Kill- Kelly to the Storybox. Sorry if I butchered your last name there. Uh, <laughs> she's the founder of The S Factor, a company focused on teaching feminine movement practice and women's empowerment, which is honestly incredible. Sheila has worked with the likes of Tony Robbins, who is an alumni of the Storybox, Vishen Lakihani as well, who is the founder of Mind Valley. Uh, she's an international speaker. She did an amazing TED Talk on speaking about the feminine and and all that sort of stuff which is incredible i encourage people to go and look that up and she's also an actress on the shows like one of my favorite shows the good doctor which is pretty cool she actually ends up getting married to her real life husband uh richard schiff if those people that know who he is and she has a great documentary which i highly encourage everyone to go and check out too it's called strip down rise up uh sheila i can go on and on on about your amazing (laughs) amazing achievements but welcome so much to the storybox podcast today I'm honored to be here. Thank you for having me, Jay. I'm honored to actually have you on the show. And I apologize again for butchering. Uh, we, we just said it a second but, ago. But maybe, wait, I, wait, you butchered maybe the easiest name. On I the know. Show, <laughs> but Kelly, I mean, Gene Kelly, Grace Kelly, come on. I know, I know. I was like, <laughs> come on, Jay. <laughs> What's going on? <laughs> you can get you can get Vishen Lakiani by Jagang and Kelly. Oh, it's actually, I'm never going to let you forget this. I know, I know. <laughs> it's going to be a funny story. Remember forever. Because it's actually what's even more funny is when I was speaking to Vision, we we um we connected at 8 p.m. at night. And like I was telling you, I'm not a night person. And it took me, I think, four or five goes to actually get his last name correct. And he was sitting there laughing at me and uh-huh. trying correcting me every single time. <laughs> but it's just it's one of those things, isn't it? Like <laughs> I think it's I overthought about it. Yeah. Wow. Well. Wow. Anyway, we can, we can. Well, here I am. You're here. That's the main thing. Um, Keely and all. Kelly. (laughs) Yeah, I got it right this time. (laughs) Um, It's really an honor to have you here once again. The very first question that I do have for you is a question that I normally love starting off all my conversations with. It is what does success look like for you? Mm. Not a, oh, not an easy question. I mean, a beautiful question, but. That's, um, that's a big question. And so I think of, I think right back, I have a question about, is it success in life, success in business, success as an actor, but I think uh, I'm going to take it on as meaning, what do I believe success in life is? And for me, I would say, um, living your epic life in your epic body surrounded by epic love. And when I use the word epic, um, you're the hero of your own tale. You're the hero of your own story. So if you can build a heroic life, if you can build a life, and I I use this phrase, a a life of the most, people are like, what does that mean? So if you can live the most of your life, if you can live the most joyful, the most fully expressed, the most uh, truthful to yourself, if you can live to the fullest potential, that you have. And for me, um, that comes through the body and the body will bring you into an epic life and the body will attract epic love. And epic love is a love that is fully lived, fully realized Mm. from soup to nuts. That that to me is success. Why do you think that a lot of people struggle to live that kind of epic life? Mm. Well, I think we're inculcated into a cultures, civilizations, communities where we have been told to curb certain aspects of who we are and especially women, but everybody, um, we curb our sexuality, we curb our eroticism, we curb our feminine, both our men, both men, women, any gender you identify it with, we curb the feminine aspects of what it is to be a, a living sentient being on the planet. And when we curb ourselves, um, we pervert ourselves, we, we change our shape, we lock stuff up in our bodies, we, sh- we, we shut down musculature, we shut down fascia. And so then we get into this place where we feel like either not enough or we're going to, or what will it be if I, if I live out loud, will I scare people away? You know, people lose themselves, they lose the full expression of life. 
Mm. And because of trying to fit into these very well structured societies and and I think our global society is structured to unfortunately curb women and the feminine from living fully expressed in their bodies. Yeah. That's very true. Um, mm. And the uh, culture is kind of shifting. And because of the work that you're doing and bringing awareness to this, it is changing, which is a good thing to actually see in the world because it is helping women because a lot of women and even some men, I, I, I notice, and I struggle with this as well, with actually tapping into the the essence of being a human and what makes us human in the first place, you know, meaning and purpose and being divine and, and um, ex- being able to express ourselves. I think there's a lot of shame, especially if you've gone through some deep traumas growing up and, and being se- openly sexual. I think there's, uh, it, I don't know if it's like this in the States, but in Australia, it's kind of like there's, it, it's almost like you're not meant to talk about it. Like you just keep it inside, like, and I've always like, no, we've got to normalize it. It's okay. Yes. Thank you. That's the word. Mm. Normalize it. Normalize sexuality. Normalize emotion. Normalize tears. (laughs) Normalize healthy, constructive rage. All emotion is biological tools of survival. All of the emotion that moves through our bodies, and there are 10 iconic body emotions. There's five light ones, and there's five dark emotional energies that are meant to flow through the body in a constructive way, right? So if you look at each and every one of these emotional energies, they have a purpose. They have a reason for being to keep us alive, to keep us in tribe, to keep us connected, to keep us in love, right? To procreate, to create joy, to create, you know, life force energy, to create a world of love. Mm. And it's, it's powerful. And, you know, I don't just teach women. I teach the feminine. I teach the feminine to anybody that wants to learn it. And the masculine men and those who identify as men have also been robbed of their feminine. You know, and I talk about feminine through what I call the five feminine superpowers. And they're the superpowers that have been hushed or degraded in some form by the world we live in. Can we dive further into the feminine versus the masculine? And I right. want to, I want to sort of, uh, give my audience context on what the feminine actually is and looks like, because I think culture has sort of tainted it. Same mm-hmm. with the masculine. I think uh, mm-hmm. they've given us these pictures of what they're meant to be, but um, I think you can help explain what they actually are. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. So for me, feminine and masculine are, are two components. They're, they're spectral energies, right? They're not just polarity. Like they're, they're very, they're, they're all encompassing the spectrum of how we experience life mm. and how we live life, right? So we all have masculine and feminine. And um, I, I was told to develop my masculine to the very best that I could. And I was the best little boy I could be. I'm actually the best man I can be um, mm. because uh, I have a more inherent and native feminine energy and feminine essence, which I was told not to develop. So I think that's true of basically almost all of us. And, and I make that general statement because I've worked with thousands and thousands of women and people who, who, uh, their feminine superpowers are kind of foreign to them. So when I, I talk about masculine and feminine, um, for me, the feminine is all that moves, all that, all that shines, all that is nature, all that changes. The feminine is constantly changing. It's, it's, she's emotional. She's, um, um, she's, um, literally emotion and movement. Yeah. And I talk about the five superpowers. So the first feminine superpower is curve of movement. Our bodies are shaped in a very curvaceous way. And our bodies were meant to put on this planet to attract love and to attract energy and to attract um, mates, right? Yeah. I think of the masculine first, the first, the equivalent with the masculine is linear movement, right? Linear straight movement. The second feminine superpower is sensuality. And if you look back in, you know, just there's so many great books that you can read about the mm-hmm. heightened level of the feminine sensuality. And the only place where the feminine sensuality is not more heightened 
than the masculine or the men's is in sight. And in fact, we have two different ways of seeing, two different kinds of ocular cells covering our eyes. Mm -hmm. So men see more line and movement, the hunter. Yeah. And women see more texture and dimension, gathering or hunting berries, whenever you like. Um, then we have, um, but, but in all other aspects, uh, women's sense of smell is more heightened, our sense of hearing, our sense of taste. And this all has to do with tribal living way, way back when we had to be able to tell the difference between a poisoned berry and a berry that would nourish, or we had to be able to hear the sound of our baby crying a football field away as opposed to the other hundred babies crying, right? So it's very biological. So the third um, feminine genius is emotability. Mm. Uh, our bodies are made to move emotion through us as biological tools of survival to create a rich, deep life. And the masculine equivalent of that is rationality. Yeah. Rationality. And then uh, the fourth for the feminine is connection and communication. And with the masculine, that's independence. Mm. The feminine is more interdependent, builds culture more interdependently. The masculine is more shoulder to shoulder, independent, go out, live the life, come back, deliver for the tribe, go out, come back. And then the fifth, um, the fifth feminine superpower is intuition. Mm. And for the masculine, that would be logic. Yeah. Right. So we all have all of that. That creates a wholeness, right? Wholeness of being. Mm. But for some reason, over the course of many, many thousands of years, we have, um, We've doused the flame of the feminine in all of us. And the feminine is the quality of life. And the masculine is the quantity of life. Mm. Make sense? It does make sense. And I'm interested in how or when you discovered all this. What was the story behind that? And what got you interested uh, in this? I think it all started uh, in a strip club and... In 1999, <laughs> uh, when I was preparing for uh, to produce a film that I was passionate about, which is uh, a film about strippers in Southern California called Dancing at the Blue Iguana. If you've never seen it, very cool independent film. Um, it's me, Daryl Hannah, Jennifer Tilly, Sandra O oh is in there. And uh, I had produced that film and originally written the script for that film because I really, really wanted to learn to do the movement I had seen once uh, at a strip club I had visited for a different role. And I fell so madly in love with the movement. Yeah. I thought, wow, look how overt those hip circles are. Look how overt that body grind, wind. Ugh. And I had been a dance major at NYU, but I'd never, ever been told or taught how to move like that. Mm -hmm. So I basically raised $4 million to have the most expensive dance lesson ever and make a movie. It's a good movie. <laughs> but, um, and once I uh, did that film, it was an improvisational film that spanned over four or five months. So I dived deep into, I think the whole cast, we dived deep into the strip club world in Southern California. I found two amazing dancers to, to be my mentors. And I learned the movement from the ground up. It was not easy. It was hard. I was had pole kisses everywhere. I had bruises all over my knees. And I was like, God, this is hard work. And it is, and it's, but it's beautiful. And it's natural feminine movement. And so after the film wrapped, I, I, I loved it so much. I loved how beautiful I felt. I loved how alluring I felt. I loved how powerful I felt in my body, so fully expressed, so free, that I put a pole in my husband's office <laughs> after the film wrapped. I had my second child, shows you how good the lap dances were. And <laughs> don't tell him I said that. Don't tell him I said that. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, normalized sexuality. Come on, Jay. Yeah. <laughs> um, so we're doing that's what we're doing and I so it. i start and i love it too i started <laughs> teaching and then oprah heard about it and oprah had me on her show twice and then my student terry hatcher was on the show and it just became this international phenomenon mm. of you know you don't ha you don't need to be a professional stripper to to dance like this it's 
beautiful if you are all you know power to you but you can do it in the privacy of your own home if you're extremely shy as as i am and so uh it just took off 20 years ago took off like i mean like like a rocket like a juggernaut and i opened and expanded to all these studios and i realized during covid that i didn't really want to have the studios anymore and, and that as painful as it was to close the last two studios for myself, it was also a beautiful way of saying, okay, this movement is, is bigger than just a studio. It needs to be everywhere in the world. So um, we're really cultivating our teacher training program and we're now doing digital classes and I'm doing a virtual live class online. Mm -hmm. So the, how it all came about was, was that it started in movement. It started in freeing my body to be unashamed, unafraid to be out loud and provocative as all get out and to really feel the fullest range my body had to move into her curves and sensuality and emotion and connection all the geniuses right mm -hmm. and the more i learned the deeper i dived into exploring i had studied somatics um as a as a in college i'd studied it after college I've, i love the body i love movement i've always loved um, the way the body expresses and lives our life for us and then gets no credit. Mm, uh, very true. I love right. that story. <laughs> it's right. a great, great story. Uh, and yeah. you mentioned something there that I sort of want to hone in on, which is the aspect of shame and not wanting to express that side of yourself, like, because, you know, it can yeah. be, it can be hard for a lot of people to do it. And I think we do need to normalize it. So um, I'm curious how we are meant to set aside that shame, that inner guilt almost, and then be able to express it openly without any fear. To express, when you say it openly, do you mean to express natural erotic movement and not natural erotic expression? Yeah, that and, and also some of our our deep vulnerabilities. So some of the yeah. things that we wouldn't actually tell other people because we're ashamed of it, how mm -hmm. can we be comfortable enough to actually share that with the world? Because I feel like there is a problem with being vulnerable. We are fearful yeah. of what others may think of it. So how can we be able to express that more? And I think when we do that, we can be more true to who we really are. You know what? I got excited. I'm excited because you're just taking us full circle back to the first question you asked me. Mm -hmm. Living an epic life. Living an epic life is leaving nothing unturned. It's leaving nothing hidden in the darkness. You asked me a question when we first started. Is there anything off limits mm -hmm. for me to ask you? And I said, no. And it all comes and stems back to an epic body, epic life, epic love. Right? You are the hero of your own life, Jay. It's a beautiful quote by uh, Charles Dickens, and it's uh, it goes, whether you turn out to be the hero of your own life or whether that station be occupied by another, these pages must show. Mm -hmm. And it's one of the most powerful quotes because we sit around and we don't believe that we are the hero of our own lives. And we believe maybe somebody else is. A woman will come or a man will come or a teacher will come. And no one's coming, baby. <laughs> you, you're it. No one's coming. And when you get to that point and sharing um, the vulnerability through shame, when you combat shame, when you face shame in the face and you say, shame, you don't own me. In fact, I own you. And in fact, I'm not going to let you be shame anymore. I'm going to see shame comes from, it doesn't come from what's hidden and what we're hiding about ourselves. But when you have nothing left to hide and you're transparent and open and free, yeah. it doesn't, it no longer has its talons around your neck. It's actually laying on the floor at your feet. Mm. Gone. Its power is you, you've neutralized its power when you no longer let it have, um, have its way with you. So a lot of the way that I have seen shame combated and I've been teaching for 20 years, I've taught tens of thousands of women. And the way that you have to move through body shame is through the body. You can go and sit in therapy for hours and hours and hours and talk and talk and talk and talk. 
But until you reclaim your body, yeah. until you reclaim what was taken from you, you will never heal. You will never be the winner. You will never, you will never, you will never conquer shame and shame needs to be conquered. Yeah. It needs to be slapped on the ass and put in the closet. <laughs> <laughs> Don't ever come Buried. back. <laughs> Don't come back. You're not allowed back. But yeah. um, I feel like, uh, so the minute you start to um, push back, push back against shame and fear and like in part of my classes, you, I, we do self-touch exercises where you touch the sound of your body, you touch skin, you touch the curves of your body. Like I'm doing right now on your radio show. Um, <laughs> and he, you touch everything and you, that's the beginning of killing shame. Mm-hmm. I, I'm, I'm doing something I was told never to do. I was given shame about it. And then take that further. I'm going to teach you how to move your body in a way that you were told not to do on some level consciously or subconsciously. And the minute you start to free your body from the shackles of shame, you crush shame. Yeah. And like I said, you'll leave it at the feet, at your feet on the floor in a puddle and just the move into your greatness. You're sloughing off the plaque of shame that's on your body. It's in your body. And I think I'm, I'm curious. Can I ask you a question? You can. Yes. Do you have, you have shame? Not anymore. I used to, and you know, I used to carry a lot of trauma yeah. from sexual abuse and mm. you know, just mental, verbal, physical, all that sort of stuff. Yeah. And I've been on this journey. Well, I was on the journey. I'm still on the journey. Let's just say that of yeah. healing those past pains and sufferings. And, you know, my kind of movement is being able to get outside in nature and running and, you know, feeling the fresh air on my face. I love the the cold uh, morning air, that for me, and just being able to sweat it out, being able to yeah. connect with nature because I feel like we've lost that connection and yeah. being able to just feel like I am strong in my own body because if I had lost that ability, I feel like I'm now weaker and I feel like now I'm open to uh, those pains that were once were because they, mm-hmm. they, they never go away. I mean, you can closet them all you want, but if I'm not strong enough to keep them closed and away from me, then a crack can open up or something like that. And, and then, it's just opening Pandora's box, if I can say that. So I've had right. to learn oftentimes the hard way in being able to be, be vulnerable with not just myself, but with other people, because I do feel like that is valuable, being able to share the deepest, darkest parts of my life and my experiences and, and being able to say, hey, this is okay. It's all right. Yeah. It, I, I hold no well, shame holds no, no bondage over me anymore with that yeah. particular experience. Mm. And I'm no longer afraid of it. Mm-mm. No, and it's beautiful. It's a beautiful thing. It is. And the way, you know, just listening to you, if I could reflect back to you is so beautiful is that it's, you did it through the body. Yeah. You did it through running, through being outside, through feeling the air. The body is the most underestimated, most powerful natural resource on the planet. 100%. Both of our bodies, all of our bodies, masculine and feminine. If you identify, I don't know how you identify, but we can we could all do better by flexing both our masculine and feminine energies and to become more and more whole and more and more epic in our own lives, right? And that's exactly what that, that was a beautiful share. And it was really vulnerable. Thank you. I appreciate you sharing that. I appreciate you asking me the question because not many people mm-hmm. do ask me that kind of question. So it's good for me to express it with you and my mm-hmm. audience, because I mean, they, they know that I love getting vulnerable, but no one really seems to ask me why, why is that the case? You know? Yeah. So I, I love that question. And for me, what I struggle with, yes, I, I run. Yes, I do all that sort of stuff, but I'm not a good dancer <laughs> at, at all, right? So if I'm if I'm trying, and believe me, people have tried to teach me how to uh, dance. I feel like I'm too stiff. <laughs> you know what? So I've gotta, don't, you, don't you throw the gauntlet down for me, Jay? 
No, I'll, I I'll, won't. I'll pick, it right back, I'll pick it right back up. I will magic mic your ass. <laughs> <laughs> I'll get you magic miking. <laughs> I'm not kidding, though. If I had a day or two with you, I would have you dancing and prancing and playing and, and deepening that rep, that 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 re- recla- um, uh, reclamation, you know, deepening mm-hmm. that reclamation to a place of a, a, a even deeper empowerment. Because I actually believe everything you said about uh, your journey. It's, I mean, of course, I believe it was so beautiful, but I actually believe that there is a way to actually open the closet door and slay shame all the way. Yeah. And I only say that because I I've successfully done it in my own life, and uh, I've seen other women do it as well, and I've seen people slay it by taking ownership. This is something that happened. It's not who I am. Something that happened. And it's actually a calling from the universe that my life needs to serve those that this happens to. Mm. Make sense? Yeah. This shit happens. I mean, if you've seen the film, the Netflix film, Strip Down, Rise Up, and you see the work I do with women, that kind of stuff, uh, sexual improprieties happen so often. It's not one in four like everybody thinks it is, you know, that's the reported cases with at least women. But I don't even know if you put men and women together. It happens so frigging often. It's not even funny. Yeah. And so it's, it's time for that to heal. It's time for that to become the warrior and the epic mm. uh, hero. How did, opinion. how did your film strip down, rise up, come about? I have been doing this work for, I guess, I, at the time, I, I had been doing this work for 17 years. Uh, and this beautiful director, phenomenal, I mean, brilliant documentarian named Michelle O'Hayan. She called my team and my team uh, reached out to me and got us on the phone together. And Michelle had been going to some strip classes and pole classes. And um, everyone she talked to, she said, all roads lead back to Sheila. <laughs> and it was adorable. And I was like, okay, well it started here and this is what happened and this is my story and this is my passion to help women, to help the feminine, to help anyone to become uh, more rich in their lives. And uh, it, it just, uh, she said, you're it. I want to work with you. I'm doing a Netflix film. This is what it's about. Empowering women through movement. I said, okay, I'm your girl. And so um, she created, we, I created a class for her to follow and she followed it for six months into graduation and um, she just saw the deeper work and the bonding and the community and the sisterhood and in, in and around this incredibly patriarchal masculine world where women have such a hard time trusting each other, where women have such a hard time building really authentic, transparent, vulnerable community. Mm-hmm. I was able to, we were able to do that for the film with the film. And like Michelle says, the camera doesn't lie. So it was so beautiful and so um it was really a magical moment. So we shot for almost, I think we started in 2018. We shot um, for that year and then she edited for the last two years and it came out and it had such incredible reception. I mean, I, I get I get contacted from women all over the world um, wanting to understand themselves through their bodies. And that's what this is. It's understanding yourself through your body. It's a beautiful film and I do encourage people to go and watch yeah. it because there is some times when I think it was in the very beginning where you had the group setting, they're all, you're all together yeah. and you're all just sharing. You're all just yeah. allowing them to open up and it's just a, a beautiful moment and I can't do it justice by explaining it. So just go and watch it <laughs> and, yeah. how, and how it sort of develops and you watch these women be able to grow and, and, express themselves more fully and yeah it's just a great great thing to um to produce in in the world and one one thing that i am curious about is you mentioned your husband now for those people who don't know who he is richard schiff and um i'm interested in what has he taught you about tapping into what you love about yourself and i guess expressing more the feminine and the masculine together so what he uh, here's what I'm here. You asked me what has he taught me. So you asked me two questions. Yes. So what is it? <laughs> I did. Yes. <laughs> Good. You picked up on it. Um, what has he taught me about 
what has he taught you about loving yourself more and then mm-hmm. expressing the feminine and the masculine together? Wow, that's a really, those are two, I'm going to take the first question first, if that's cool. That's cool. Um, what has he taught me about um, be, being more in my feminine? Yeah. Is um, there's so much I learned by watching men, watching um, uh, him, my man, and watching him watch me, watching him watch the world of the feminine. And through his eyes and other men's eyes, I saw at strip clubs watching the extraordinary um, otherworldly power mm. that a free feminine body has on a cisgendered heterosexual man is extraordinary. Yeah. I'd never realized how in awe the masculine was um, at, uh, at with the at the feminine body and movement it's really quite arresting and so watching him watch me learn the movement and then watching me bring it into our home for my everyday weekly workout and you know sometimes i would we'd be working out in the same space because i put my pole in his office which he's also his gym and i'd be doing my dance and i'd be like undulating on the wall and swirling on the pole and just feeling myself and I'd look over and all of a sudden I'd just look over to where he was and he would just be watching. Mm. Not obnoxiously, just beautifully. There's this beatific smile on his face. He'd just be watching in such awe and appreciation and splendor, no matter how much weight I had gained when I had my second baby, I gained 55 pounds. She weighed seven, figure it out. (laughs) Um, So no matter what my size was, my shape was, my age is, no matter what, he still has this extraordinary look of appreciation and love from afar that it really, really taught me a lot about our love, but it taught me a lot about just the power of the feminine body. I was, I was schooled by the heterosexual cisgendered masculine eye as to how beautiful we really are. We female creatures on the planet in movement. The second question is, how has my relationship with him helped me understand masculine and feminine? Yeah. How has um, your relationship with him taught you about loving yourself more? Well, this this journey that I've been on of reclamation uh, for 23 years now has actually elevated our entire relationship Mm. because I realized um, I realized when I had this extraordinary pull to go learn this movement I'd seen at a strip club once, because it's something that I want, I scared the shit out of me. Am I allowed to swear? Yes. It's okay. Okay. Scared the crap out of me. And, but I, that meant I had to learn it because I, I, I love fear. Fear means yes. <laughs> um, you have to. And so I, I went and learned this movement because I knew that it was something that was missing in my own life. And when I learned that movement, all of a sudden I realized that it had been missing in my whole relationship. Mm. That I had been brought up to be the best little boy I could be and the best mini man I could be. And I was working and playing in the masculine playing field. Yeah, I could be as tough as any guy. And I was competitive with him. I was competitive with men. I was competitive with everybody. And then I realized when I learned that movement that there's this whole other playing field over here. This entire playing field, half it's mostly empty. That's mm. the feminine playing field living fully in my feminine. It was all like no women were doing that at that time. And all of a sudden I was like, okay, well, I'm just going to go and I'm going to expand and be epic in this place. Mm -hmm. And when I did that, I brought so much erotic polarity to our relationship. I brought so much heightened feminine energy that he had no choice but to rise in his masculine Mm -hmm. to meet me. He had no choice because we're so in love to, to challenge me to continue to rise. So we're just both our king and queen of our castle. We're constantly lifting each other up, up, up. There's not an ounce of me that wants to compete with him anymore. I don't want to castrate him. I think women get used to castrating and competing with the masculine. I just want to elevate that man so much. I want him to feel like the most virile man on the 
planet in my life. Mm. And he wants me, he wants the same for me. He wants me to feel like the, the most extraordinarily beautiful erotic creature on the planet. And he does make me feel that way. 32 years in. We have figured something out that is magical because the sexuality is still there. The eroticism, the mystery, the passion. Like we're like two, it's so stupid. We're like two teenagers. And it's because of these two separate playing fields. It's because of S factor. It's because of this journey. And he's not afraid of the feminine within himself. He's very in touch with his emotionality and his sensuality and his connection. You know, he's, he's what I call an A-man. How do you know if you're actually in love or not? You dream about them constantly, even though they're sleeping right next to you. Mm. <laughs> and 32 years later, you're still having erotic dreams about him. That's crazy. It's like, wow, this is crazy. Um, you know you're in love when you can stare at someone and just look at them for hours and hours while they're sleeping or watching baseball, football games, mm -hmm. and just be in awe of the breath he takes and the masculinity of his beingness. And you smell him, and the smell is just intoxicating. It's like, it's through my body I know I'm in love, through my senses. And my senses tell my emotional heart that I'm in love because I smell him, I see him, I touch him, I taste him, and he's so everything. He fills me up into this place of epic love. Make sense? <laughs> it does, and I'm I'm still learning this. And I don't I I love myself, I know that, but I'm yet to be able to express my love or love in general to another person. So I know that's gonna happen one day. It's just finding that person <laughs> okay, where we, so, we can both express. Uh, uh, that's really beautiful. And, and I love that because you're absolutely right. It starts with you. I mean, if I can humbly, you know, say to you after 32 years of being in love with this person that, and you're just beginning that search that um, it, it's a, it starts with you. Yeah. You fill you up, you heal you, you become the hero of your own life. I'm telling you, get that epic body going, which you're starting. I think you should take some kickboxing classes. I think you should take some ballet classes, maybe S factor class, and just stretch in every direction possible because the body will teach the life, the life and the body draw the love. Mm. At least that's been my experience over and over again. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I, I realize that much later after two, I wouldn't, yeah, we'll say failed relationships. <laughs> they didn't, they didn't end very well. And I sort of had to uh -oh. realize, Hey, I'm not ready yet. I still have a lot of work that I need to do mentally, yeah. emotionally, spiritually, and physically to become the person that is actually worthy of someone else that is at that stage as well. So we can both connect. And then there's that right. beautiful moment of we're both, building each other up and not tearing each other down. So yes. there's no, there's no like, yeah, there's no tension. And I felt there was a lot of tension before there was a lot of arguments. I mean, arguments do happen, but every argument that did happen, we were just tearing a piece of each other off mm -hmm. just every single time. Whereas an argument, you come back and you, you actually apologize. You mean it and you're not, vehemently trying to tear that person down. So, mm -hmm. yeah. No, I think, and I think it's such a strong, what you're saying is, is something that's epidemic. Yeah. It's every, every, almost every relationships that I, I know so many relationships I know they um, sometimes find their way in a lot, sadly down this kind of cul-de-sac of, of, of tearing each other down yeah. uh, for some reason. And I was there. I know. I know what that feels like. I was there. He and I were there. We were not in a perfect relationship for the first 10 years. It took every ounce of our, both of our beings to stay. And we had two kids. Mm. Um, but we had to stay there to, you know, commit to figuring that out. And um, 
it's, I don't know what it is other than I feel like the feminine of us are trapped and don't realize that we are actually not trapped, that it's kind of like a, a Pavlovian response that we're stuck over here in this masculine place competing with the masculine. Mm-hmm. When in fact, there's this whole other world that we can own, should own. And, uh, and, and perhaps when we choose elevation instead of degradation, and that's like a conscious effort that Richard and I had to do for the first mm-hmm. um, when we started to really turn our relationship around, that was conscious choice to elevate, 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 elevate. Because I saw the world and the world is going to tear down as much as it can. The world challenges us, as we all know, in some intense ways. So if you have a partner who's building, 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 building you up, oh my God. And that's just, that needs to be the new paradigm. And, and that's what I teach. Um, that's what I teach in my workshops and stuff. It's epically unstoppable. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I love, I love that. that. Oh, that's a good one. Epically unstoppable. Ooh. Yeah. That's just rolls it rolls off the tongue. <laughs> it does, man. You know, it's I, I'm living proof of it. And yeah. you know, some people are like, nah, this could never happen. Men and women aren't supposed to, or or a masculine feminine or not, because I'm not gonna I don't wanna uh, exclude um, same-sex couples, because I think you no matter where you are in a relationship, you, there is a masculine feminine component of polarity. And so I think that we, all of us, uh, when we're able to fill out and find our true essence and then live it out loud in an mm-hmm. <laughs> epically successful way, um, mm-hmm. there's nothing like it. You know, it just, you can't help but surf life right in the moment at your greatness. And, you know, life, like I said, going to throw shit at you. You're going to lose things. You're going to lose people. You're going to lose jobs and careers and things. And, you know, if you are in fighting shape, if you are in an epic body, in an epic life, you can surf that stuff fully. Right? 100%. Yeah. This is, uh, this is powerful. And I know it's going to help so many people. So thank you so much, Sheila, for, for sharing. Before I ask the final two questions, where can people find you, connect with you, and learn more about what you're doing? Sfactor.com is where they can find my movement. And uh, I have a blog, SheilaKelly.com, and I also have Instagram. I'm on my Instagram quite a bit, and I put out a blog once a month about them and living a feminine life and having an epic relationship and how to do it. I love all that. I'll make sure everyone knows where to go. Just Google your name and yeah. you're not hard to find at all. Um, <laughs> Sheila, this is a question that uh, I haven't asked in a while, but it's more of a fun one because I, ha- I do feel like we have been serious, which has been great. But what would you say has been the weirdest food combination you've ever tried? Oh my gosh. <laughs> great. Um, it's going to have to be pineapple pizza. Oh, no. I just don't think, I just don't think sweetness goes with pizza. Pizza's savory. Yes. So exactly. why put a pineapple on there? I don't get it. I have an yes. issue with that. You you too? Yes. I, I don't <laughs> get it. I don't understand <laughs> it. <laughs> no, how can you ruin it? I mean, you've got the savory sauce and then you cheese and it's melted and then sweet pineapple. No. Weirdest. Yeah. I don't get it either, but some people do. Uh, and I'll just, I'll love and accept you for, for that. <laughs> but I'll, I'll just prefer my pizza without the pineapple. Thank you very much. We used to, growing up, my dad used to actually get uh, pineapple pizza. And what I used to do is I used to take off all the pineapple all the time because yeah. I hated uh-huh. it. So it still kept, did it still leave the sweetness on there though? It did. The, it kind of, yeah. kind of destroyed the pizza yeah. for me. It ruined the experience. It's terrible. <laughs> I'm so happy I found another pineapple pizza hater. Yes. Same here. <laughs> yes. Growing the community ever, ever so, so big. <laughs> um, Sheila, this is my, my last question for you. It's my all time favorite question. I ask all my okay. guests at the very end, it's a hypothetical one, but I want you to imagine okay. with me for a moment that you've been able okay. to reach the age of 100 all your friends and your family have decided to put together a film for you of everything you've ever said and everything you've ever done. Don't ask me how in the world they got it all. We'll just call it magic for the sake of argument, but they've been able to get it and show it to you on your hundredth birthday. What do you want that film to say and to show about your life? Jeez, that's a simple question there, Jay. 
Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm I know. Uh, that's a big one. <laughs> uh, and my hundredth birthday, my friends and family on. Am I on a global stage or am I on a local, you know, home stage? It's friends and family. All the ones that you want to be there are there. I think that what would be on there would be. It would start with clips of home movies, starting with my first child's birth. Well, with Richard and I first getting together into my children's birth, into my animals. And it would evolve into the TED Talk. Mm. It would evolve into the legacy that is S Factor, that it would be, there would be another film that has been shot about the legacy of S Factor and how S Factor has set the scene for so many other feminine movements and how the feminine is rising to a place of equal power and status in our society. So we're, we're balanced in our kind of partnership society and that, and that I had some small part to do with that. And it would show the normalization of the erotic feminine being and body with no shame. And then I had some part to do with that. And then it would close, again, going back to the home movies with my grandchildren and my great-grandchildren and my dogs and my cats on my ranch out in Montana. And it would be a beautiful, sweet night. And Richard and I would cuddle up and and watch this together with little tears streaming out of our eyes. That's what it would be. It's a beautiful movie and a beautiful send off message. Sheila Kelly, thank you so much. I got to ride this time. (laughs) Thank you so much for your time today, your story and all the work that you're doing and for joining me today on the Storybox podcast. Oh, you're welcome. It was absolutely delightful. And I still want to magic mic your view. (laughs) I still want to get you moving uh, in your dance, in your dance mojo.